wizened into permanence. My own face, sunken eyes and mouth open, black pits to bury a piece that perished in my first embrace. But I don't know whether you'll still have the stamina to stand uh, next ball, which was intended to be my uh, sort of main ball. I wish I could break with the formality of this room, but I feel it's too much for me. Perhaps if you help me run through this, we can manage jointly. This poem is a sea poem, and I said earlier on I have this problem about writing short poems. Uh, poems always tend out to be, turn out to be seedlings for me. I go back to them, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. This started as a very small poem, and then it became a poem in three parts, and then I wasn't happy with that, and I went back to it, and it became ten parts, and now it's seventeen. Um, and uh, since you have told me to press on, we're just going to have to sit through it. It's a poem about the sea. Its roots go back a long way to visit uh, on Prince Edward Island, and then uh, it seemed to become visible above the ground when I went to Jamaica, and finally flowered, if that's what it is, when I went to an island off the coast of Spain during my sabbatical. Let's see if I can cope with it. Rhythm of waves. <clears throat> One. Drumbeat of waves. Slow march of the surf against the coast. I lie in shifting sands, listening to the wind's fifes, watching the assault. A formation of gulls shells the silence with their cries. The tide is running ashore. Lichen fan out across the rocks. Green, gray, yellow, beachhead of the sea. Shall I throw my shadow into the battle? In my temples, passion pounds its brute rhythm. Let the wind hone the edge of my voice. I draw it from the throat's sheath into the singing air. Two. Pounds waves, pound this shore, tear at cliffs and dunes, claw the intractable land. I know the fury of your passions. Your paws have left their marks on all the world's coasts, and I was once ripped in a blind flash from the bottom of inertia and hurled by you into sensibility. You want me back now? These rocks are armor and shield bearing your crest, and your spume-feathered spears cannot pierce time. Sorry. Your spume-feathered spears cannot pierce them. The land shall outlast your seven lives, and all of my generations live out their death, faltering in the sand, prostrate or supine. I lie, you fall, in waves, lunging at water, washing my feet. Three. At the center of the surf's roar is stillness. This conch, mouth and ear of the sea, holding sunken secrets under a rhythm of waves, down to a whisper, a soft hiss in a surge of voices. Four. Other voices from other shores, distant, mud-baked, famished, rice farmers harvesting a cyclone, fishermen with a tidal wave in their nets. Only the strongest survive. Old men drown still, and children have not long to scream. Women plead with wailing claw at the last straws of life their struggles swept away next. And then the men, their pride choked out of them, pitch their brute and shock fiercely into the breach like sandbags against the century's worst storm. Only the strongest survive. Brute, see, your salt burns bitter on my cracked lips. On your back, the wind drums a dead march. A single wave shattered 500,000 men, women and children. An estimate that cannot measure or account for the real, the loss, the die. Five million screams, perhaps more last words, plucked from tight jaws, wrenched open by death. Words without echo or hearing in Bengal Bay and estuary. Five hundred thousand corpses, still now, their lullabies choked out of them, face down in the sea's cradle, floating faceless among faces, corpses 
their harvest songs drowned, cadavers raging through uprooted weed woods, ravaged flesh hurled into the green flames of insensibility, consuming water buffalo and sea shanties, corpses, water corpses, cyclone corpses, down the holy river, washing away the blood, dark stains on the clean sweep of the mud-churned tidal suck and toe of the receding flood. Five. How many single waves smashed into the coasts of time, cyclone smashed? How many five hundred thousands shattered all estimates of life? Number the stalks, the wheat ears, the grains of a prairie harvest. Rich harvest on the sea, in the sea. Six. Water, water, rain, river running, water into the sea. I am water, weeping, singing water, singing sea. Heal my cracked lips in your salt mouth. I am burning water, burning with drowned words, waves burning, move, torch bearing, in slow march formation of spume speared riders. My voice crossing them, a black sail cruising to other waters, other shores. Seven. Press your white lips, whisper into now my ear, tell me the dolphin's secret, and why the whale, the shark, the water, why I, pure one says protoplasm, why I hear a rhythm of waves, the wind blows, the trauma of fish coiled deep in the cave of the conch, the sea breathes secrets, I hear a hum hiss in the shelled void, weed woods drift on the tide, the wind blows sand secrets, grit between my teeth in the trauma of life, the sea blows salt, Kisses to grim riders hurling spume spears at my eyes in the coil of the can conch, swift as sharks' teeth, a hiss, thunders, strident as the sea's horses along every coast. I fall, I lie under the water's hooves. I hear a trembling of fins, drowning last words. The wind whispers into the white lipped conch, tells me the dolphin knows the salt of the sea as the tang of death on my tongue, burning sand salt words, shark smell, a rhythm of waves, the whale blows, hisses, spits in the sky's face, I want to, but I cannot keep my eyes open forever like the fish, I smell, I taste sand clenched secrets, cradled in queen conch I hear, drowning on the tide I see, white riders salt wind whipped, the sea, the flesh of the sea burning, deep dark whales in the sky's face, my body is my trauma, is seagull shadow over king conch in water hands, root sea, gentle now, back to soul, water, my hands, gentle, my skin has no scales, bearing your green wash, burning pure as protoplasm, I feel rhythm, I am of waves, sea salt, voices, everywhere. Eight, save our souls. In the storm valley between two mountainous waves, something snapped midships. The rivet seems the hull cracked, split the freighter in two. 37 sailors, clinging like lichen to rig and tackle, calling their gods, their wives, their mothers for the last desperate time. S.O.S. <coughs> to the gale-torn sky, calling rescue, calling port, calling help, lifeboats, calling till their voices are pulled up from their throats by their roots in the lung. Thirty-seven puffs of breath tossed into a tempest. The white fury of the hurricane is their winding sheet. All hands lost. Save our souls. White, sleek majesty of a ship fit to rule the seven seas. She was a queen, uncrowned before she was ever crowned. The ice sliced open her belly in her maiden sleep. The water broke in, a titan titanic nightmare and disgorged music and terror into an ocean where the stars danced softly to a rhythm of waves. 1513 lessons in thalassography. None can rule the sea. Limbs untried or worn grow lame and memories young and old crowd into a moment of regret or defiance or truth and then dissolve quickly in the acid bath of arctic waters. A few bubbles of air equal 1513 lives lost to the fish regardless of age, to a dance of star lost to love regardless of sex, a harvest of race, color, creed. Oh, the fish, number the fish in the sea, tell the sperm whale from the great white shark 
save our souls. Halfway across the straits, the overcrowded ferry capsized, or she struck rock, reef, sand, or something caught fire. Do the fish hear us scream? No list of passengers or crew, no count of hands or souls, they perish, known and unknown, the proud, the nameless, the poor, not even the strongest survive. The eruption of brine or shark, the green flame in the delicate chambers of the flesh. The sea gives and takes, body to soul, to water, to dust, to water, and back again in the ebb and flow of generations, in a rhythm strong-armed waves beat on the hard drum skins of eons of fish backs. The pages of the sea's chronicles are crowded with the signatures and crosses of the drowned. In gale and tempest, fire and battle they went down, captain and mate, pirate and explorer, merchant, slave, the gold crazed and the god crazed, fishermen who never returned, two skeletons in a forgotten lifeboat. They went down in dogger and smack, catch, skiff and cutter, down they went down, in argosy, brig, clipper and dow, ironclad, caravel, tramp and trooper, in galleon and galliot, sloop and shallop, in sampan, schooner, saik and pram, down, 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 far below the thunder of typhoon, fuel, typhoon and tide, they went down to still valleys in the, in the ocean's mountains, to lie down to eternal rest their bleached bones black and unburied, scattered in crustacean fields where no light shines, requiem in pace, peace unknown in the singing air. Save our souls is the code of death by drowning. Nine, bitter ballads of the sea on the cold lips of this conch. The wind blows a tune on the cracked flutes of salt-crusted cliffs. Where am I? Is this the coast where the blind old king stands naked at last before his fool? Or the templed rock where an ancient king threw himself into the sea when he mistook the black sails of his returning sun? Or was it here the children of the sun worshipped their murderers as gods because their skin was white? Is this the pilgrim's promised land, the coastline of a holy covenant no land or sea or god has ever made or kept? From where I am, I see the bare rocks of Newfoundland, and the forests of Vancouver Island, the fabled crags of Crete, the island of the Holy Mountain, the carving glaciers at the Poles and Peru's Guana coast. I see chalk bluffs and limestone caves, the headland of a hundred capes, dikes, volcanoes, reefs and sand, sand, shreds of sand scattered on every coast and continent, buff brush strokes of an ancient art along the wine-dark sea, or etched into rock and ore, the short, bright lines of sand, time ground to measure in the hourglass of ebb and flow, the short span of life. And all about the jutting land I see water, water, rain, river running water into the sea that has dominion of this earth. All land is island, water locked, water bound. I am water, singing water. If it had rained another million years, I would be fish still, still in the singing sea. <coughs> On every coast, the king is naked to his fool, and he who stands on the Acropolis knew why he threw himself into the sea. The monster lived, although his son had slain him. The monster lives, though every knight errant, saint, and hero has slain him a hundred times. He lives under assumed names in the masks of man, the beast. <coughs> he murders the children of the sun, whatever color their skin, and waits in cove and cave for the elect. He came from the sea and to the sea he must return. 10. Hoist your black sails, ship of fools. You'll catch the protean monster in the nets inside you. They tore off the poet's head and cast it singing into the sea inside you, singing ever since seeing the shark and his skill in a rhythm of waves in the singing sea inside you. 11. This section is for Pablo Neruda. A bullet in the back of the neck, then push the body over the cliff. The fish won't mind. These white, yellow, brown, red, black bastards. Blood's all the same to them, and water washes it off your hands. But it's not the same to us, if anyone thinks that he can think, speak, eat, love, dress differently. He's the enemy. The difference is what makes the difference. I can't wait to get my hands on my hands on my stones, clubs, spears, bows, knives, guns. To kill is to survive. Providence is on our side. Come hell or high water, say la vie. 
It's the next world that counts right here and now. Leprosy, cancer, arthritis, it's in the mind. Mind over matter. They're poor because they're lazy. They're sick because they don't wash. They're starving because they never, they don't ever, they're never, ever, you know. The trouble with all those foreigners, youngsters, politicians is they don't know when to tighten their belts. They don't have any respect for respect. They don't know their true Allah, Baal, Jesus, their Krishna, Moloch, Buddha, Osiris, Jehovah, Zeus, Lord. Wicked, idolatrous, infidel, heathen, heretics. They've lost their souls to sin. We must put them to the, put them to the, put them to the consciousness of hate, love, torture, trial by water. If they drown, they're innocent. They're innocent. We are the elect. We save by strangling, bless by hanging. The kingdom of heaven is for the weak, is a drug trip to slavedom, is nirvana for the poor in spirit, for the rich. Keep their heads well above water, is flesh them for the strongest to survive. The main thing is to get laid in sacred ground. That's what an education is for. They got an education because they're rich. They're rich because they got money. They got money because they're bloodsuckers. Never get into hot water. Down with the, down with the, down with, down. We have no use for the rich, for the poor, for people thinking instead of doing not thinking what everybody else is not thinking doing. It is not for us, it's against us. A blindfold and a firing squad. Law and order. The kids are innocent. Or maybe they're not. The wife should have known. Still waters run subversive. Screw her. Let's all screw her. Ma married to treason. The whole bloody pack. Gang, mob, platoon. Screw her from here to eternity. Sperm runs thicker than blood runs thicker than water. It never stopped raining a million years for three whole weeks. The river rose, the dam broke, flooded famine. It hasn't rained a single drop in three years. Famine is devouring my people. And the others won't share. They want us dying, dry breasts, dry eyes, dry mouths, mute. The point about pain is that it hurts until you don't feel, don't remember anymore. There is never enough water under the bridge. Punch, kick, twist, stab, whip, burn, choke, make him tell what he what we want him to tell. Stop him saying what we don't want to hear. Suffering makes a man strong and wise. Gouch out the eyes, slice off ears and nose, tear out the tongue, castrate, disembowel, draw and quarter till the spirit is broken. Massacre, matter, over man. Search and destroy the enemy of the prophet, of the god, of the faith, of the leader, of the state, of the nation, of the people, of the country, of the city, of the family, of every one of us everywhere, all over time and space. It's out of this world. Nuclear warfare is, it really sends you, bombs you, missiles you, right out of this world, you and your friends, neighbors, and relatives, all at one go. That's the strategic advantage. You can't wash off strontium-90 with soap and water. Those who don't ride, drop, die right away, at any rate, the enemy will, just rot to the bone, slowly. C'est la vie. We shall overcome. Everybody overcomes everybody else. To the last man, woman, and child, victory, contra omnes, there's no defeat, c'est la mort. All survivors are victors. Victory or death, that's God's own sacred truth. Twelve, take it from me, Thalassa. My eyes, Thalassa, O Thalassa. My hands, water, wash, ash, O Thalassa. Thirteen, black hand against the blood sun. A gull drifts, screams, dives swift as a harpoon. Harvest of the sea, the kill. The wind gives me the kiss of life. Is the salt I taste on his lips or on mine? I am fruit of the sea, brought ashore in the wind's nets before time knew hour, before I or ear knew beauty and sense power. I have carried the sea through eons of transformations, through swamp and forest, across mountains, desert, prairie, into every city of the world. I swam, crawled, climbed, ran with the surf thundering inside me. Since time put me on my feet, the sea has surged through generation after generation in the ceaseless tide that pounds now in the temples of my skull. The fish regard me with unflinching eyes. Am I the prodigal fish returned? Or the dark reaper reaching from the infinite sea of the blue wind into their green lives? Or am I a mere configuration of sea and sun? Shadow on black wing, the wind screams, gull schedule, gull's shadow, beak fixed, swift as a bayonet, across my throat, across the sand, a wave is felled like a line of soldiers. 14. Salt sea, your cracked lips move forever, though nothing passes them but the hiss and wheeze of your brute passion. No wonder you gave birth to a monster. And yet your second child was gentle, golden-haired goddess, cradled on a conch to a rhythm of waves. 
inseparable pair, king and queen, who shall overcome? Salt sea, you throw your children to the mercy of the sun, trauma of fish. I lie unlanguaged in the placenta of time, struggling to shape the silence at the center of my bones. You swallow the words burning in my throat and give me back the surf. I hear my body to love lost, drowning in a gull's cry. 15. Water, water, rain, river running water. The sun is bleeding darkly into the sea. Night hoists its black sails, carrying the constellations up and down the generations of my ancestry. I am water, singing, weeping water. The wind blows shadows over the edge of the cliff. King, fool, and poet stand naked on the tide at the shore of death. My sorrow and my toils have the taste of brine. The dolphin will not part with his secret, and the shark never sleep. The promised land lies at the bottom of the sea, pure as protoplasm inside you. The whale is dying out. Voices in the surf, in the cold lip conch, falter in the sand. 16. The tide is running out to sea. Gulls harass the slow retreat of fish. The sun's shadow is stretched out in the sand for the night. I stand, salt wind whipped, a mere configuration of sea and sand, burning body to soul, to water, to dust, to water, and back again in a rhythm of waves of love, torrents cannot quench, nor floods drown. O oh, dolphin sea, let the tides heat beat in my temples, beat the drums, beat the drums against the cold sleep of rocks. 17 against the cold sleep of rocks. I harbor the pulse of the sea in the singing air. Thank you. I'm quite prepared to talk to you if anybody wants to talk to me. <clears throat> Howard, do you want to come up here and uh, say anything or shall I just sit down and shut up? Pardon? No, I don't. Sorry. Don't have one here. How many which? Oh, one. Well. No, not really. I have occasionally tried. But you know, in order to do that, one has to have a language in the marrow of one's bones. I really speak only one language. I dabble in a few others, but... Uh... Well, I have translated from three, no, four, I suppose. That doesn't mean that I know the languages from which I've translated, though. Well, I wouldn't say that it was, but uh, that may be, yes, that may be uh, the fault of my dreary uh, reading, of course. Of course, uh, there is a general sense of sadness of the poem, I suppose. It comes from the tears in all things that Virgil talks about, I think. What do I suppose? What do I suppose that is not universal? I don't quite know what to make of that line, of that question. Can you? I'm sure that when you define the question, you have answered it. What is universal that I don't suppose? Fun? Yes, it's things asked. There's nothing terrible. Well, I suppose every poetry is every poem is extremely personal. Um, no, no.
no one can really write a poem except through the body of his experience and the spirit of his self. In that sense, it's personal. But this poem, of course, shifts back and forth, doesn't it? Across mythic ground, across real geography. One moment I'm standing in a very specific, uh, describable place. The next time I seem to be up in the air, uh, looking at the whole of it. This moving back and forth, it's of course an attempt to encompass a kind of total experience of the sea, which has always uh, meant a lot to me. And um, in fact, it's a subject of, of a novel that I've been working on for some time, which is really all about the sea. And I feel that uh, a human being is, in the end, nothing but a walking piece of the sea. I mean, that's really what we are, a bag full of seawater. Every time we taste the salt of our tears or our sweat, as it says in the poem, we are tasting the salt of the sea in which we once moved. And that sea is inside us all the time. Every time we let some out at one end, we have to replace it at the other. And so I see man as a kind of walking piece of the sea. And, um, and so I, I feel this is a very relevant kind of subject to deal with. I, uh, not that I chose it, it chose me. Don't say that, I'll, it'll turn out to be 54 <laughs> sections if I go back at it. It seems to me to be long enough and I'm somewhat embarrassed to present it to anyone. I have to keep writing until what? Yeah. In the end, I, of course, it's my belief that every poet writes only a single poem all his life, and every poem he writes is just a single line in that poem. And I won't know what that poem is about, really, until it's all over, and that means I'll never know. So when I stand here pretending that I know what I'm doing, I'm uh, really being rather foolish, I think. When? Oh, well, that came out of looking at Montreal, sometimes at night, from the Mont Mount Royal and the moon shining upon it, or looking upon the St. Lawrence River. I can't tell you exactly when it's about, uh, would it be? That's the, the only really sort of old poem there. It must be a couple of years or a year and a half, I don't remember. I don't know that either. That's one of those things one sometimes dashes off. You know, when you put the pen to paper, things just happen and you, you go on and then you're finished and then you decide never to publish it. That really does, does happen like that. Of course, it, you do work on it, but the, but, the, but the poem tells you what you have to work at. It's not a poem that I feel, well, there it is. I mean, it's, it's a piece of doggerel, as I have, I think, quite rightly said. Well, because, you know, I have my vanity, I've written it, I don't want to throw it, so many things I've totally thrown away, and I thought I'd try it out and see uh, what would happen. And nobody walked out, at least no, not during the intimation. Many things one writes one doesn't read at all, because one knows they haven't come off. That poem has come off, but it's such a doggerel that that doesn't mean very much. But the things that uh, one doesn't cope with, of course, one confines to the waste paper basket. That's what it's for. Very simple things, yeah. Well, that kind of thing I do when I write poems for children. That side of my nature I can indulge in on that, on that area. It's a good question. That's a good question. I suppose I'm doing both. Um, that sounds like a contradiction, let me state from the beginning, that I think only contradictions and paradoxes are anywhere near what I would consider true. Uh, I'm doing both because I am paying my respects to a man who I think was a great poet and a man who, was, uh, who lived a life, um, his work and his life, that I can respect. A man of humanity who in the struggles in the world has taken a stand that I can respect and at the same time quite clearly the poem casts more than a shadow of doubt on a, a political position that's either left or right and uh, I find that there is no dilemma, uh, no way out of that dilemma.
the problem for me has always been not to become paralyzed by the acceptance of that paradox, of that contradiction. Yeah. It was very perceptive of you to, to notice that I had hoped that it was it would turn out to be more of a praise than it turned out to be, that there was nothing I could do. I really like Neruda, I've translated some of his poems, I have some, brought some along just in case you know, somebody should ask for them. And I, uh, I wasn't actually suggesting that you didn't. <laughs> Suppose that was a leading suggestion, wasn't it? But I didn't, I had made up a list of what I would read, but you never know these things. Things happen just in a cryptic poem, I suddenly felt I had to stop. And, uh, I do like him, I do like him better than that poem seems to suggest. I, I really have to confess to a dilemma there. Somebody wanted to ask a question back there? No? I don't really, I can't really answer any questions actually, because, because I really believe that all questions contain their answer. All I can do is help you see that. Yes. Can I read? No, I didn't bring any along. Uh, I don't know if I can quote any by heart. Um, the only ones I could uh, quote by heart, I suppose, would be the simplest of them. One I remember, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's a motor car in heaven, but the driver is in hell because he cannot spell. Uh, an artist in Edmonton drew a marvelous uh, illustration of that in which you see a, a little boy stacking up blocks with letters and he's writing the word car, K-A-R. At least uh, these poems are not so weighty. I wish I could write poetry that was less weighty. But... <laughs> Maybe it is. That block of wood, uh, of, uh, the, the, that heap of blocks is very weighty. I'm sure that will collapse on the wall. Yes. Well, uh, <clears throat> you really, you really want me to read that again? Is that a kind of overwhelming? I mean, I, you know, I'm. Why don't you sort of come then and I reach? I feel terrible about imposing upon people. I always feel that they're all itching to go home, and I'm standing here guarding the doors, and so. <laughs> That's true. But I was told to read an hour, and I think I read more than that. Didn't I? Howard, you are the master of ceremonies. Aha. Uh -huh. Pardon? Yeah, I have. Anybody want to hear a sea poem of Neruda's? Maybe we can give those people who want to go home a chance to go home, and I feel better about reading them. I mean, I will not take it as a personal insult. We have other engagements. You probably said, oh, I'll drop in there for half an hour, and then I'll meet you at the tavern. Well, I uh, think I brought them along, just before I left. Yes. Um, problem. Th this is a cycle of love poems by uh, Neruda, which I have called Keys of Sadness. It's actually called Vente Poemas d'Amor ni una canción desperada. But which to read? Um, because I'm certainly not going to read all 20. <coughs> Pardon? With the cherry tree? You remember these that well? Which number is that? Uh, this is a nice one, I think. I think there are grapes in here. I'll try that. Is that all right? For, uh, this is number five of these poems. For you to hear me, my words will be tender and taper off at times like seagull tracks along the sandy shore. Necklace of small bells, wild for the touch of your hands, soft as grapes. And I watch my words withdraw from me. They are yours now more than mine. They will, cl they will climb my... I'm Sorry. They will climb my ancient grief like ivy. They are escaping my dark caves, the way, the way ivy climbs up damp walls. It is you who is to blame for this cruel game. You fill everything and everything is full of you. 
Words filled the solitude before you moved in. They are more accustomed to my sadness than you. I wish now they said what I want to tell you, so that you could hear how much I want you to hear me. But anguish is a storm wont to scatter words, and the hurricanes of dreams hurl them to the ground. In my heart-sick voice, you hear other voices, laments from ancient mouths, blood of ancient supplications. Love me, companion. Don't abandon me. Follow me. Follow me, companion, into this anguished wave. My words will have the color of your love. You inhabit everything, and everything is inhabited by you. I will make all my words into a necklace without beginning or end for your hands to touch, soft as grapes. I'm sorry, that was not about the sea. Uh, they're all really uh, about the sea, but uh, this one not as overtly as uh, some of the others. Um, here's another short one that's a bit more overtly about the sea. Bent into evening, I throw the nets of my grief to catch your marine eyes. My solitude falls overboard like a lengthening shadow, and like a drowning sailor thrashes its arms in the burning tide. I fire red flares across your drifting eyes, flashing like the chop at the edge of a lighthouse. My distant woman, sole guardian of the dark, at times I make out in your glance a menacing coastline. Bent into evening, I cast the nets of my grief in this sea surging through your marine eyes. The night birds are pecking at the first stars that light up bright as my soul when I love you. Night gallops on its dark and sullen mare and scatters its ultramarine seeds across the land. It's a very strong poem, I think. Any more questions? Otherwise, uh, I thank you very much for your... Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm prepared to read it if you're prepared to sit through it. But it's a problem, you know, when one wants to hear it and the others don't. Howard, you are the MC. Read it. I think it's a bit much. Eh? Well, I'll read it to those that remain. That'll be the end. It's poem with the... Thumbnail sketch. Pretty Ivan has gone. He could give us a th better thumbnail sketch than I can. Well, he's a, a poet who, um, who uh, Chilean poet, South American poet, who um, actually had a different name. He took his name from a street in Prague. Uh, there's a street in Prague. Most people don't know that, but when I was in Prague, I was told this. And he was a poet who committed himself very young to the communist cause and uh, wrote and lived in support of the communist cause and came into his own, of course, when in Chile um, the Allende regime came to power and when Allende was killed, he died just about the same time. In fact, there was a kind of momentary confusion at which one wasn't sure whether he had not in fact been executed and shot. More likely, he, broke a, he, he died of a broken heart because uh, I think he must have had enough sense to know that what Allende was doing was uh, was rather romantic if in a society in which the United States has the economic power that it has you wish to have a revolution you must destroy the opposition or it will destroy you for Allende to have thought that he could achieve communist regime in Chile by democratic means was simply foolhardy romantic naivety for which many people had to pay with their lives it would have been better if those who destroyed Allende had paid with their lives first but that's my view but I didn't make the revolution because I don't like killing people. I ended it, and you can't do it halfway. And I have a feeling that perhaps Neruda must have felt something like I have just expressed, watching the inevitable doom as the Americans were uh, pouring money and agents into the country in order to overthrow Allende. 
You see that I have sympathies with the left in spite of my dilemma. I've never allowed it to paralyze me. Perhaps it's only when you have those misgivings that you have a moral right to fight. So, 11, and it won't take us to 11. I'll just take about uh, four minutes, and this gentleman can have it.